Yeah, thank you for uh, coming out, all of you. Um, behavior of screws is what I'm going to present on today. I want to uh, point out that the uh, slides are available under this particular link here. So if you want to get access to the slides with more explanation, you can download it there. I want to start the presentation by showing this particular picture of a child sitting in a corner for a five minute timeout because it didn't behave as we expected it to behave. That's something that many parents here in the room probably have tried. We tried it too, it's not really working great. <laughs> but it's you know one measure of um, trying to force a behavior to a person. If we don't understand the behavior of the wood screws that we are using, we can also put them into a five minute timeout. They won't really care much about it. And the only ones that are punished by not understanding it is we as the engineers or uh, design team. Or even suppliers like us are punished with it if you don't get the capacity that you want. So if we don't understand what the wood screws are doing, we are punished in our professional life by experiencing a lack of capacity, a lack of stiffness, or even like we may be taking away ductility. And oh boy, if you take ductility away from a structural engineer, that's really bad. That's like taking candy away from a child, right? So we don't want to do that because then we are forcing our connection systems into brittle failure modes. We can also be given things like moisture or we can be taking away moisture. Being given moisture or taking away moisture is also bad because if we are given moisture, wood start, starts swelling. If we are taking it away, it starts shrinking. None of this is good for the behavior of our screws. For fire, it's the same case. So if we, have, um, if we are taking away a char layer, it may also be uh, an influence on the behavior of our wood screw system. So for the presentation today, I want to cover the basics of the structural behavior of wood screws so that everyone here in the room understands on how to create a soft connection system, a stiff connection system, a ductile or a brittle connection system eventually. To get started, we need to understand a few basic things. One of them is we have two basic screw types that you find in the industry. One is a partially threaded wood screw to your left-hand side where the threads extend along portion of the wood screw, typically between 30 and 50% or something like that. And to the right is a fully threaded wood screw where you can see the threads go from the very tip to the very uh, head. So those ones are two entirely different performances and fasteners that we need to know. If we are loading a wood screw in tension, like pulling it out of the wood, we typically get this kind of performance where we have a very steep load increase. If we are loading it in shear, we typically get something like this. Um, some sort of linear load increase with uh, a certain measure of ductility or deformation capacity. If you're driving in fastening systems or wood screws on a 45 degree angle to the force direction, such as we see here or here, we can again influence the capacity, the performance of the system to something that is stiff without much deformation capacity or something that is stiff initially with deformation capacity at the end. In order to understand or to design the behavior of wood screws, we use design codes such as the NDS or in Canada, TSA standards or in Europe, uh, Eurocode 5 standards. So the design codes provide us with all these uh, funny equations that allow us to um, predict the behavior of the wood screws in our connection system. There's also design codes available or, or proprietary code reports or uh, product approvals from ICC, for instance, in the US. For the city of Los Angeles, whoever comes from the city of Los Angeles, you guys know that you need these uh, LARR, Los Angeles uh, Research Reports, to use certain products in, uh, in the high seismic area. And up in Canada, we have the uh, CCM reports, the Canadian Construction Materials Center report, that is the equivalent of an ICC report in the US. So those code reports or product approvals will provide you with a variety of design data, such as shear capacities, head pull-in resistances, withdrawal resistances, potentially stiffnesses of your connection systems and so on that you can rely on. Now with international trading coming in and you can see it on the trade show floor, there's, there's a whole variety of uh, European um, glue lamps, CLT suppliers, fastener suppliers and so on. And we are potentially engaging into converting European data into US data or Canadian data into US data, Canadian to European data and so on. So whenever we have behavior conversions or, or uh, conversions between design codes, which are very different to what we do in the US, um, where we do allowable stress design here and then characteristic design here and limit states design here. So those things are not necessarily easy to convert. And whenever you are converting these units, you need to make sure that 
you know what you are converting and not just interchange design values that you have listed in, in European technical reports or ETA reports, Canadian reports, or US reports. Like this is something very dangerous that we should pay attention to. One of the most famous conversion mistakes is this thing, the Mars uh, Climate Orbiter, I think in 1999. This thing failed because the uh, computer that was feeding the units into the system was an imperial unit system and the computer that was reading it was an SE computer system and because of that 325 million US dollars were wasted on this mission and it was not successful. So in this case it was only money that was wasted. In the case of a building if we do unit conversion mistakes or capacity conversion mistakes or a, a mistake on judging the behavior of fastening systems from European data to US data, we can have much more damage than just money. So the behavior of wood screws in mass timber projects can basically apply to post and beam connection systems, to balloon framing or platform framing, whatever you have, you will need connections in all of your uh, framing systems. The first connection we want to look at is a very standard system, it's a surface spline. So the surface spline has a cutout in the CLT and you're putting in uh, a half inch or one inch uh, plywood to uh, allow uh, shear transfer in between the panels. Typically these plywood joints, our plywood splines are then screwed down into the CLT panel and if we are loading it, we get this typical load behavior of around 1500 pounds per pair of screws, ultimate capacity. And you can see the connection can be formed for about two inches before failure. If we subject this entire uh, assembly to reverse cyclic load, we get this kind of performance. We can see a little bit of oh, about 20 to 30% uh, dynamic load degradation here throughout the entire deformation range. In the ranges where we design here around 120 pounds per screw or so um, in allowable stress design, we do not have much difference between the, the uh, reverse cyclic curve, which is the dotted line, uh, sorry, the, the, the static curve, which is the dotted line, and the reverse cyclic uh, curve, which is the, the black uh, line. If we now look into a half-lap joint, a half-lap joint is something very commonly done in CLT as well. We basically overlap the panels. The disadvantage of this system is that when we overlap panels, we lose panel width. We have a lot of panels beside each other. At the end, we probably need to put in one or two extra panels to make up the, the width of that lap joint. The advantage of the lap joints, however, is that you can create a large variety of connection performances by changing out fastening systems. So the load displacement curve that you see here on that uh, chart is a typical half-lap joint with a 5 sixteenths wood screw and a three-ply panel just driven uh, across the plane. The capacity of that system ultimately in the testing here is around the 3,000 pound mark, so it's about twice the capacity of the, of the typical uh, surface spline joint. And we maintain a fairly linear, nice predictable increase at the beginning, and then we have about an inch and a half or so of deformation capacity before the system fails in, in shear. Looking at the dynamic loading curve, we again see the same performance, like in the ranges where we design down here, 200 pounds per screw or so, 250 maybe. We don't have much difference between the quasi-static loading curve and the reverse cyclic curve, so in the design ranges it looks like it, it's not a, the biggest problem to design with the static loading data in general. Now we want to look at an entirely different system. So we again have a half-lap joint. The half-lap joints um, need to be designed carefully, number one, for the connection capacities, number two, to allow the CLT manufacturers to machine the panel in one run without flipping or turning it. So we want to keep that half-lap joint typically in the three and a half inch width. Anything under four inches in width will basically work without um, uh, turning the panel and on a much tighter tolerance level. So for this very same joint here, for the half lap joint, we now don't have a fastener driven in perpendicular to the joint, but we have two fully threaded wood screws. Now we switch from a partially threaded screw to a fully threaded screw on a 45 degree angle and a screw cross so that we can transfer load in both directions. The performance you can see is very different to what we saw before. We have a much higher increase or much steeper increase, like it's almost a vertical line, still around the 3,500 pounds or so in capacity but almost no deformation ability of the system. Like at half inch already, we have failure. So the system is much stiffer and much less ductile. In terms of uh, dynamic loading or reverse cyclic loading on the system, we see the same uh, behavior again. In the ranges where we design down here, 500 pounds, no difference. And then some, uh, somewhere up top here, we do see a little bit of dynamic load degradation. 
overall, the performance of the system is much stiffer and a lot less ductile um, compared to the regular Shear 2 application. So a more ductile behavior is what we see in the typical panel butt joints. So a panel butt joint is basically just a straight edge connecting the panels with 45 degree fully threaded wood screws driven in through the shear plane into the panel on the other side. This is what we consider at least as a very nice kind of ductility curve because we have a very nice predictable increase at the beginning up to again the 3,000 pounds per pair of screws and then we maintain the load while we increase deformation with, which is more or less the, the definition of ductility, right? So we maintain the load while we increase deformation and we don't have any load drop. So this is a very nice connection system. It doesn't require a lot of machining. It requires a little bit more installation time potentially for the screws, but overall a very nice performing system. In terms of um, reverse cyclic loading, we see again the not much differences there. For this particular connection, this was the only connection in the entire testing setup that showed uh, a higher performance in the dynamic loading compared to the static loading. So there seems to be some effects that are still neglected. Some of it might be the rope or string effect of the screws that engage after um, the connection has deformed. So that's something that needs to be uh, further looked at. Now looking at a, a brittle connection system that can be a wood-to-wood -wood connection system like we have here in a, in a typical five-ply um, CLT panel. So as soon as we get fully threaded wood screws in on an angle to the wood grain and we have enough meat, uh, down here basically to, to hold on to the wood, typically around the five to six inches. We have a very hard time pulling the wood screws out, but we will get close to failing them in tension. So that's why we see this big increase in capacity here from around 3,000 for the three-ply panels to 6,000 for the, uh, for the five-ply panels if we use the screws in tension on 45 degree angles in a regular half-lap joint. As you can see, there's almost no ductility in the system. It will perform rather brittle. So depending on what we do and how we arrange the wood screws in the joint, we can significantly influence the behavior of the screws in a joint from something very soft and low capacity to something very brittle uh, with a ductile, uh, not, not ductile behavior. So as a fastener supplier, we of course want to create a multi-tool or we believe that wood screws are one of the multi uh, purpose tools that we can use in mass timber construction, similar to a Leatherman tool, which we have all used while camping. So the Leatherman tool can do many different things. It can open a, a bottle of beer or it can pull out a nail. Um, and we think we can create the se very same um, ability with wood screws and connections to deform and to behave the way we want them to behave. So the ideal scenario from our point of view would be something that pre behaves high capacity and stiffness initially, and then it allows us to have some ductility in our connection system. A way of doing this is combining fully threaded tension screws at 45 degree angles, those ones here, and regular partially threaded screws across the shear plane on a 90 degree angle. Because the two systems here, like the fully threaded screws, partially threaded wood screws, have different stiffnesses, um, the fully threaded screws take up the load first, that's the stiff line that we see here, and then as soon as they start pulling out of the timber, we create this ductile behavior of around one inch of deformation capacity in the system. Looking at the reverse cyclic loading again, we see the same kind of one to one and a half inch of deformation capacity of the connection and a little bit more dynamic load degradation when we compare the static load test compared to the reverse cyclic test. Again, in the ranges where we design around the five to 700 pounds per uh, per fastener or per connection section, we don't have a lot of difference in the static or dynamic loading. Now, the behavior of wood screws in <coughs> mass timber projects or buildings typically is one element is the, the wood to wood connections, which we address, can be uh, surface line, half lap joints, butt joints, or other elements, or other connection elements. And in, in a typical building, we will also have interfaces between steel and wood and potentially down here between concrete, steel, and wood as well. So we want to look at the behavior of screws in steel uh, to wood connections as well. Steel to wood connections, we again have two options. One is to have a steel plate with the fastener driven perpendicular to its plane, uh, acting in plane shear. Um, there's this famous word again, shear, that we always use. Or a fastener driven in 
uh, on a 45 degree angle to the, to the uh, force component utilizing the fastener and tension. These systems can be used at, as uh, kind of hold down systems down here, connection elements between stories, angle brackets here, concrete composite systems, drag strut systems. They are very versatile, they can, use, it can be used in many applications. Here from a project locally where someone was uh, building a swimming pool out of CLT. This, is, uh, this can be a problem. I already mentioned earlier that we have uh, wood can absorb moisture and it can give up moisture, it can swell and it can shrink. So if we have like a, a 10 foot uh, steel plate here with a lot of fastness driven in it and we have the wood swimming pool or the CLT swimming pool here and the CLT absorbs a lot of water during construction, the wood will swell first, imposing some sort of stress to our fastening system already before it's even loaded. Then once the building is enclosed, we crank the heat, the wood dries out very quickly, and now the wood starts to shrink, and it's putting a stress on our fastening systems again. So whenever we have systems like that, where we have a material that can shrink or swell like wood, and steel, which is stable in those conditions, and the wood tries to pull away from the steel, we will be subjecting our fastening system to some sort of stresses, which we call restrained shrinkage or swelling stresses. We need to pay attention to this. For shear connections in general, we don't see it as a big issue because we have a lot of deformation capacity in the system up to between one and two inches, depending on what you do. So it's not a, a, the biggest deal for these systems. A typical test shown for a steel to wood side member or a steel to wood connection with a steel side member quarter inch thick, typically looks like that. We can see we have an inch of ultimate deformation capacity and a fairly predictable performance throughout the entire system. Max is out around 6,000, 7,000 pounds per screw uh, pair. So that compared to the regular wood to wood connection is roughly doubling the capacity with the steel side plate. So sometimes if you are looking for extra capacity in a surface spline connection, you could potentially switch out a plywood surface spline to a steel surface spline and you would get a capacity increase. Now looking at more or stiffer connection systems for the, uh, the tension screws with full threads, we can create uh, moment joint ideas or uh, uh, strap details here. And for those particular details, because they are behaving very stiff and more brittle, we cannot allow that the wood starts shrinking and swelling like we saw before. We need to make sure the wood remains in stable conditions between 12 and maybe 50% or so moisture content. The overall failure mode of heavily loaded tension connections, this is from testing that happened about two weeks ago at the University of BC in Canada, um, loading a connection system with 16 half inch wood screws, uh, five inches of penetration into a Douglas fir glue lamp. We were able to load this connection with about 115,000 pounds while we maintain a uh, half inch of deformation capacity. That was when the screws basically pulled out of the timber element. So they did not fail in tension, they just pulled out of the timber. This is how the test setup looks like. So it's basically a Douglas fir member with very tight screw spacing, 45 degree angles, half inch screws, and we load it from the top with a big actuator, right? So 100, around 112,000 pounds ultimate load on the system with half inch deformation capacity. So it seems like when we have connection systems failing in withdrawal, we do get some ductility out of the system. Having something like this is the opposite. So this would be when fasteners or screws fail in tension because they are embedded so deep in wood that they do not pull out anymore and we are restricting the connection capacity um, with the steel tensile strength of the wood screw. So for these joints, if we have that kind of scenario, they are very brittle, like 3 16 displacement at around 9,000 pounds of load, so there's not much, well, not any uh, deformation capacity, uh, at least in, in my opinion. So whenever we are designing these systems, we need to make sure that we have some other ductile element in it that can uh, provide the respective ductility in the system. Steel to wood connections for mass timber uh, buildings do not stop with regular steel plates, like they also apply to post and connection systems or pre-engineered connection systems in general. Pre-engineered connection systems, typically made from mild steel or aluminum or custom-made hangers or whatever you have, it's the same idea. It's a steel plate that is screwed into our timber element. We can 
house these systems. And there were some interesting talks about fire protection and charring of wood yesterday. So if we are providing a housing in our column to conceal the connection system, we have a clean joint which is protected from fire and it has the ability to carry large loads. For the testing for this particular project, the pre-engineered connection system was loaded to around 90 kips. Um, yeah, around 90 kips. Uh, with a displacement of around a quarter inch. So again, the vertical displacement of these more brittle joints is not tremendous. It's a quarter inch of vertical displacement overall at around 90 kips of load. The real design load for this connection was somewhere down here, with so with a safety factor of three approximately, and in that particular section we have very, very little displacement. Of course, the 45 degree um, screw technology does not only apply to the wood-to-wood -wood connections, then the steel-to-wood connections, it also applies to the pre-engineered connection systems where aluminum is used. For pre-engineered connection systems with aluminum hangers, they are basically using aluminum because it's easier to machine, it's lighter to transport, and easier to handle overall. Again, these systems would be expected now because we have 45 degree screw technology to perform fairly brittle with even less deformation than we saw in the previous joint. This is for this particular uh, <coughs> hanger not the case. Like we can see, we can load it um, up to almost 100, uh, almost to 95, uh, 95 kips here for the system, and we gain around one inch of vertical deformation ability of the connection system before failure. So this is one of the examples on how to design the 45 degree screw technology for this particular uh, project. It was designed in a way that the screws are over designed, and because it's over designed, we force the failure mode, not into the screws, but into the aluminum plate and the tension rods, uh, the mild steel tension rods of that aluminum plate. So if we know what we are doing and we know how the fasteners behave in withdrawal and we know the loads, where they fail, we can design the failure into a different element of the connection and provide ductility out of that high performing system. Now something funny when we think about the behavior of wood screws, we also need to think about concrete. For me as a wood person, thinking about concrete is not something that I prefer, but sometimes it helps us do things. In this particular case, we want to copy some of the smart concepts that all of us have used in concrete design already. Concrete is notoriously weak in tension. It's very good in compression, it's very weak in tension, and we put a ton of rebar into our concrete elements usually to take the tensile stresses. If we look at wood, wood has the same kind of weaknesses. There's inherent weakness in perpendicular to grain splitting, the weakest and most dangerous failure mode in wood. It's parallel to grain shear failure, also dangerous, brittle, doesn't happen too often really. And then we have perpendicular to grain crushing, which is very weak, but a fair, fairly ductile failure mode overall. So when we look at these typical failure modes of wood and how we can reinforce these systems, I want to take the exact analogy we have in concrete. So in concrete, weak in tension, we put in rebar, the rebar ribs engage mechanically with the concrete and we cannot pull it out anymore. If we do the same thing with a piece of wood and we drive in a wood screw into our timber element, a wood screw doesn't have ribs but it has threads that now engage mechanically with the, the timber and we cannot pull the wood screw out or the timber cannot split anymore. If we utilize the same design method, the same analogy we have in concrete, and we apply it to typical problems in timber engineering, such as notches, openings, be it like a purposely drilled opening or something that a contractor did because he felt like drilling a hole in the high shear zone, <laughs> or perpendicular to uh, grain compression problems, if we are hanging big loads from big girder beams, or if we have timbers checking. So when timber checks, that's one of the issues that we see a lot, like people freak out if, if a timber checks and they say, oh, it's cracking, it's cracking, it's cracking. Checking is very normal for wood, cracking not. So there's actually a definition on what a check is and what a crack is and what kind of influence that has on timber. So if we have checking in our beam elements that is reducing hev uh, heavily reducing the cross section and we have no continuous stress travel anymore, we can apply the mechanically jointed beam model that, uh, that Chris basically already applied for the mechanically jointed beams or the, the, the shear key beams, we can do the same thing with, with fully threaded wood screws driven into the timber beams at 45 degree angles to take the shear uh, longitudinal to the beam axis. 
The reinforcing technology, of course, applies to mass timber as well. And uh, we have this reinforcing technology in notches, for instance, perpendicular to grain crushing issues. If we have columns, for instance, landing on CLT panels for uh, kind of um, panel to uh, floor panel to wall panel connection systems or for rolling shear issues in our CLT panels. Also, the reinforcing <coughs> technology can be applied to existing buildings or new bolted connection systems. For instance, if we have regular bolted connection systems like we see here, we can reinforce the bolted system across the grain and improve performances up to a factor of three overall by avoiding splitting of our bolted connection system. Now, the behavior of wood screws is what we wanted to talk about a little bit. We wanted to understand and see what the difference is between the partially threaded screws and shear, the fully threaded screws in tension, and that we have two different general screw types that we can use for design. We also looked at the behavior range that screw connection systems have when we use them in different angles to the grain or at a 90, 45 degree, a lot of embedment, not so much embedment, steel to wood plate applications and so on. So looking at these charts we, can, uh, charts, we can again see that the behavior range that we can get with simple screw changes uh, is very wide and we should be using that for the mass timber uh, construction industry. So in summary, we can basically say that using a screw in shear like that and changing it to something like this makes the biggest difference in the world on our connection or screw behavior. Thank you very much for your participation and attention. I hope this was informative. Thank you.